Hey y'all, welcome, welcome back to Inner Stage Window, my Saturday stream, which is a stream Club of my friends. Moon gifted oh my a gosh. tier one sub to Localbury underscore. They we have given starting... 85 gift subs in the channel. 85, holy cannoli. We holy are starting shit. off with a gift sub for Brie. Lunar, thank you so much for gifting that to Brie. Also, hi Lunar, I see you with the first. Hi Brie, I know it's been a minute. Um, and I am so excited to to t say to you guys that guess what? We're not talking about Harry Potter today. Oh my God. Landon, say Thank hi God. and tell everyone we, what we hi. are talking about. <laughs> We're talking about the Hunger Games. Oh Which my God. for some reason on my TikTok, it's like, listen, I know that the world is watching. I understand that like every technology thing is connected. And so of course I'm making like a deck and researching Hunger Games stuff. And then all of a sudden my TikTok starts showing Hunger Games like analysis and stuff and i'm just like this is crazy but i really appreciate it because man oh man do i love this series oh my gosh thank you so much for the hell and you watched them for the first time brie had you read the books when they came out or was it like you read the books and never saw the movies or was like was watching the movies recently your first hunger games experience tell me tell me tell me um, and the reason, big reason, oh, sorry, that was creaky. Big reason why I ask is because um, a couple of uh, disclaimers at the beginning, as always, this is not a spoiler free stream. If you are watching or listening, we are going to spoil the whole fucking yes. first book and probably mentions of the other books, too. So if you um, if you didn't read Hunger Games back in the day, I can tell you that this is something that gets better with age for this stream. This would have been my third time reading the first Hunger Games book is it gets better every time. So like if we spoil it for you, don't think you shouldn't go read it. You still should. Yes. Yeah. You absolutely should. Uh it's it's really, really good. Um it it holds up extremely well and it's aged much like fine wine mm -hmm. in terms of relevancy. Mm -hmm. Um my comfort thing sometimes to watch like on the background is Watching people, especially like adults, react to the Hunger Games movies for the first time. Uh, and because I, I think that there was this perception of Hunger Games as a kid's movie. It's like Twilight. It's like Harry Potter. And uh, the reality is, is that it wasn't any of that. Uh, the media just, and we'll talk about that in a second, but the media pushed that narrative forward. And so, so many people didn't watch it uh, and are now discovering it to realize that like, holy shit, this is really good. Your name's lit, actually, for real. Yes. <laughs> Bri, uh, oh, okay, I, I totally understand what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think there is a certain age preteen early teenager age where you you get to like one thing and if you like more than one thing then you're traitorous to your one i understand but you know what you can go back and read it now and i promise it's amazing even if you already watched the movies even though you're gonna watch this today you should still go back and read it they're um, super easy reads mm -hmm, yeah it will not take you long it's very easy so landon also before we get started um let's give some content warnings can you let everybody know some of the themes we're going to talk about so they can just in case they don't know hunger games <laughs> Yes, we don't. I forgot we don't even have a slide for that. No, uh, no, we're just going to say it here. Vi violence, specifically <laughs> violence against children, uh, discussion of abuse, uh, particularly uh, familiar uh, or family abuse and abuse of children. Uh, you know, just overall dark, dark things of capitalism and uh the ways that you have to survive in poverty. We'll also be talking about racism, as we often do here on this channel, uh, and the ways that it's been interwoven within our literature, and also the uh, the expectation of media as a whole. So those are like the, I think the big trigger warnings coming up. Uh, if you don't want to hear anything about those, then this is your cue to sign off. Uh, but I will say that like. Learning about this stuff through literature and through media that we consume is the best ways that we can improve ourselves and also see the world as a bigger whole. So it's true. And I is to listen. And I know you guys, you're all a bunch of degenerates that love the hurt and the angst anyway. So you're going to stay. I know that. Yes. Yes. Lynn has also, rainbow hair. I do have rainbow hair. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, she got that. You got that two weeks ago now. Yeah. Right? Coming up on three, two or three weeks ago. Yeah. 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 Mid-February. 
Yeah. It's faded. A, it's faded a little, but it's holding it up pretty well. It still looks good. It still looks good Thank faded, you. though, for real. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's get into it. I'm going to show everybody the deck. So, yes, The Hunger Games, dystopian YA that changed the world. And, yes, it is very dystopia. And it, it is, is also very YA at the same time, which Beautiful. is great. It's, I think, so, like, we are jumping from Harry Potter, which talked about the uh, creation of the modern-day YA genre, that, that there wasn't really a spot for YA as it looks like today. Uh, I think Hunger Games, what it taught us was what YA could be. That YA could be taken just as seriously and just as deeply and be just as influential as all of this fictional bullshit things that we like to like praise, like, you know, Shakespeare for. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, welcome in, Zasu. Is that a good way to say your name or should I say Zasum? Let me know what I should say. Um, yes, we're so excited. This is our very first Hunger Games stream. So that you guys are aware, we're going to do each book. Neither of us have read the newest one, the Songbirds um, and Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes or something like that. Anyway, we're yes. going to read that one too. We're also going to do an episode all about the movies. So mm -hmm. this year is going to be absolutely amazing. If you the love the Hunger Games, you should Hunger absolutely Games. drop a follow if you haven't, because we're going to do like a whole bunch of Hunger Games uh, streams mm -hmm. this year. It's going to be really super fun. That's okay. That's okay. We're only talking about the first book today. We're only yes. talking about the first book today. And also, I will sit there and say that because of the length of the books and the movies and also how storytelling was involved, there isn't that much difference from the books and the movies. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that you get a bigger insight into the world as you always do with the books. You get a bigger understanding of uh, Katniss as a character. Um, however, J-Law plays her so ph phenomenally well that if you've seen the movies, you know what we're talking about. Yeah, you know the story. <laughs> you didn't miss much from me if you just watched the movies. You really didn't. So, yeah. All right. Shall we get started? Yeah, let's go. Let's, let's go. Do as, let's do as we always do, which talk about right here from the top, our favorite things. So, Karen, what is your favorite thing about The Hunger Games? Okay, so four favorite things I decided I want to talk about the OG, the swaggest of swags, as the kids would say today, he got the Riz Cinna. <laughs> I just got learned what Riz. Riz meant the other day, okay? He and now I'm going to use it. He got that Riz. <laughs> he got that He got the Riz, y'all. He got the Riz. Okay, Cinna. The like, oh my God, he is so, so cool. I absolutely love that even from the first book, you can tell like he's one of those guys that's like, yeah, I live in the capital, but like, I don't totally agree with what's going on here. You know, I was just born here kind of energy. Um, I love how like gentle he is with Katniss. I love how... Um, you kind of get this insight into him through Katniss and uh, and he is such a genuine character and you know it because that's who Katniss is always attracted to. She's always attracted to the characters that are really truly themselves. So yes. like from the outset, you're able to root for Sinna and I just love him. Thank you so much for the compliment on the slides, um, Zasu. Landon put, puts a lot, a lot of work into those. He I... is our slide person. So does Karen. Karen search, searches high and wide for all the screenshots. But here's the thing. I love a good slideshow. It's one of my favorite things. It's why I'm a teacher. It's because I like to make them. So thank you for the slide. Yeah, we're, we're both educators. So yeah. <laughs> but you know how much we love Cinna so, so much yeah. that we even kind of um, had a little like, wait, that's my favorite thing too moment when we were discussing what yes. we wanted to talk about like we both wanted to say <laughs> like, um we both wanted to say know. Cinna so well, Landon we, I would also like to give you a moment to to gush about our boy listen here I'm feeling a little wild today with these comparisons but here's the thing about Cinna Cinna feels like the so the whole capital is like just blind to the abuse that they cause for all of the other districts and how they exploit the other districts. Sina feels like that one kid that like lived and studied abroad, but doesn't bring it up every second of the day. Like just it's like a tidbit where he really actually learned the point. And I'm like, Sina. Which district did you live in for a little while? Because there's no way here in the capital. Like, you had to be outside of the capital at some point. 
uh, <laughs> he just he took gets vacations it. in District Four all the time. Something, yeah, you know, vacations I don't in know. District, or, or that he was like, actually, I like visited District Six one time, and I saw how terrible like some people were living, and I really learned from that. And so now I had to like learn and educate myself even more, and it makes me sick to see what we're doing here. But also, these are of my people, so I'm not going to try to radically change anything. Uh, but I will, however, be an ally and a person of confidence and will maybe grow as the books go on. Yeah. Oh, my God. The arc that he goes on. OK, so we're not really here to talk about the later books quite yet because I haven't I haven't done my reread. I assume, Landon, you haven't done your reread either. But the arc that he goes on is oh, like is so beautiful. good and it's so inspiring, so good. you know, it's so good. Yeah, it's um, so good. Slides go, by the way. Yeah, slides uh, go. And, the... and we and we upload them to Google Slides. So the navigation yes. is Google Slides, but slides go we get is where we get the designs. Yeah. Slides um, go is awesome. <laughs> it is my favorite. Yes. Uh but yes, no, and I and I do love Cinna. And I also think that like Cinna is story-wise an amazing character. He is the he is by far the only gentle character that Katniss allows in her life and to listen to, like everybody else in some aspect has harshness. The only other gentle character that we can see is, is her mom. And Katniss holds so much uh, resentment towards her mother that that gentleness is considered weakness. And so Cinna being this soft-spoken, gentle person who just approaches Katniss with empathy and understanding and Katniss allows for it, he plays such a, a distinctive character, not only in the capital, but in the story. Mm -hmm. And we as the we as the readers, I think, just like cling on to that, too, because it's like that softness in a world of harsh reality. Well, and the thing is also is that um, one of the things great about Hunger Games uh, that you recognize in the political struggle is it's really not much about Katniss. And mm -hmm. so you end up in a situation where narratively she has many, many, many um, mentor figures, you know, so you've got you've got Hamish is kind of her Obi-Wan, but Sin is also kind of her Obi-Wan, too. And so is Effie. And like, so, you know, and it just kind of goes like on and on and on of all these different characters. Um, but for all of which, them, Sin is the one I identify with the most, for sure. Which I also think is extremely like I love that Suzanne Collins breaks the mold in this way because it reminds us that Katniss is a child even as like in the back of her mind subconsciously children look at the adults around them all of the time as whether it be mentors or not no children don't usually typically have a singular mentor they have teachers they have parents they have adult friends that are guiding their way and so like to break the traditional trope of a singular mentor that's guiding a children into their greater path and hero's journey having several of them it like feels more grounded and more realistic and it's a beautiful way to like break that trope yeah. it just it make, it's just like those tiny little things in the story that just makes me so happy <laughs> there's so so much about hunger games you're gonna hear us say this over and over again there's so so much about hunger games where you're where we're like oh that's so real like the way that yeah. that, that, that trope is used in this is so close to the way that that trope presents in real life um, yes, it's it's yeah. a familiar trope, so we're comforted and love the trope, but it's also familiar to real life, which means that we can then put ourselves into Katniss's shoes and relate to Katniss as a character, even if we dislike Katniss. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But before we get too far into yes, that, yes, 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 I would yes. like to ask Landon, what is your favorite thing for this first Hunger Games book? I mean, do you have to ask? If it's not Cinna, it's our other queer character, Caesar Flickerman. Uh, Caesar Flickerman, for those of you who don't know or might need a refresher, is the host of all of the entertainment about the uh, about the Hunger Games. Uh, he does all of the interviews. He's really just a broadcast star. He is a celebrity of the Capitol and kind of embodies that uh, that sense of like what the Capitol stands for, but in a way that is so fake, but also charming. 
<laughs> that you can't help but like I just love him as a character I love him as a foil and I also think that he just brings so much joy and now that I've seen the movies I cannot separate Caesar Flickerman from the movies from Caesar in the books and I just... no, he's the same He's, He's the same. same. And, mm-hmm. and and we'll talk when we get to the movies episode, we'll talk about how excellent the casting is. But like there are just some in the head that you're just like, no, this was the perfect person to play this role, and this is how I forever see him. Mm-hmm. And the other so, thing that's really great about his character is like you can very easily imagine him as like, oh, instead of having a different person host the Oscars every year, it's just the same guy over and over and over. Like he's literally like every Oscar host ever all rolled into one person. And so he's so incredibly charming, not only with the Capitol, but with the kids from the districts as well. Yes. Everybody loves Caesar. It does not matter. Well, and it's just like such a useful tool tool of like, he's such a great aspect tool of propaganda because Mm -hmm. like things that like we didn't necessarily read on this first read through because we didn't have an understanding as much as like the concept of parasocial relationships but like now that we have had a lot of research on what that looks like knowing that like that's how the entire capital feels about caesar everybody loves caesar has this parasocial relationship with him feels connected with him he's basically the celebrity of the district of the capital and because of that anything caesar says is the voice of god even though he isn't in power so president still can use him as a tool uh, and does use him as a tool as we'll see both in this obviously in this book but later on in the series much more later yeah i am also in parasocial with uh caesar flickerman yeah um, so am i I, it's fine. <laughs> I you know every day i get up and i just say how can i be more like caesar <laughs> yeah I want to embrace life as a tool for capitalism. For that's, sure. Yeah, that's my that's, purpose. That's the goal. He seems very happy. <laughs> he seems so happy. Um, and it just, I, I love also, like, in our choices, we have two foils of each other. Like, mm-hmm. we have Sina, who is not resentful of the capital, but recognizes the harm and covertly does what it can to disturb that. Whereas Caesar doesn't necessarily recognize the harm and instead does what it can to increase the harm um in order to benefit his own game and and it's really an interesting choice that we've chosen like literally two opposites here yeah. oh but they're so good they're so good <laughs> and uh, and we wanted to make sure that we spoke about them as well so hence they end up in the favorite things category. of course favorite <laughs> things all right so now that you guys are all excited Um, Let's do what we like to do also towards the beginning of these and remind everybody everything that happens in this particular um, piece of media. So Landon is going to summarize the plot of The Hunger Games for everybody. Yes. So The Hunger Games takes place in the nation of Pan Am, uh, which is a post-apocalyptic North America society. Uh, and, and how it's structured is that the wealthy capital rules over and exploits 12 surrounding districts for their resources and their label, labor. Uh, as punishment for a past failed rebellion against the capital, it, which resulted in the uh, obliteration of the 13th district, one boy and one girl between the ages of 18 or, and 12, 12 and 18, are chosen... Uh, from the 12 remaining districts in a form of a lottery sort of sense to participate in the Hunger Games annually, which is a contest in which these tributes fight to the death in a series of uh, in a series of trials that is then broadcasted to the entire country, uh, typically in an outdoor arena, um, but it changes every single year. So it's very much like a reality TV show. Uh, Katniss Everdeen is a 16-year-old girl living in District 12, uh, which really focuses on the concept of coal and fuel in the Appalachia uh, area of North America. Uh, Volunteers for the 74th Annual Hunger Games because her sister Primrose, who is 12, was chosen. Um, She is picked alongside, or she goes alongside Peter Malark, who's a former schoolmate of Katniss. Uh, And there's an odd relationship there because uh, Peter Malark saved her life at a later, at an earlier point in time uh, by giving her, by burning bread and giving it to her 
uh, because she was starving along with her family. Um, in the days leading up to the games, the capital of the capital, they're advised by their drunken ma- mentor, Hamish Abernam, the sole living District 12 victor of the Hunger Games, and Effie Trinket, who is their chaperone, uh, and various stylists, including Cinna, to uh, how best to win the games. Um, Cinna designs Katniss a special costume. Uh, that will set Katniss and Peeta apart and introduces them to the public by lighting them, mostly Katniss's dress, on fire. Uh, And there is how Katniss gets her nickname, The Girl on Fire, which is then used as basically a promotional tool and a way to, like, be popular amongst the fans of the Capitol, who uh, can then be used later on as sponsors to get tools within the Hunger Games. Um... During their evaluation of by the game makers, Katniss uh, shoots a little arrow and ends up getting the highest score amongst all of the other tributes, which kind of puts her on the map as a surprise. Uh, as they're training, they meet Rue, who's a 12-year-old from District 11, reminds her of, of Primrose er, a lot. Uh, she's kind of following Katniss and Peter around. And then on the day before the games, they have an interview with Caesar. And that is where it was revealed that Peta has been in love with Katniss all along. Uh, Katniss. <laughs> what? <laughs> Katniss is pissed, believes that. Uh, is like, how dare you hold this for me? And then is also like, how dare you play me like this in order to get sponsors? Uh, you betray me. And then Hamish is like, shut up. You guys have a love start, like star cross love here. You both can get sponsors from this. Uh, but then the games begin and nearly half the tributes are killed within the first 10 minutes at the bloodbath. Uh, Katniss is told not to go and get a get a pack of something or any sort of weapons but she of course being Katniss doesn't listen and um ends up being able to get a few things and because of her skills of having to hunt to survive uh to feed her family uh she is able to survive a few days in the woods no problem but the game makers don't like that so fireball on Katniss and she ends up running right into what are called the careers. Careers are from districts one through four who have been trained and schooled on how to survive the Hunger Games in hopes to win. Really, those those districts have taken it in stride with this punishment. Um, so PETA uh, nearly escapes them. And what happens is that Rue... Uh, is hiding in a tree nearby and alerts Katniss of tracker jackers, which are uh, poisonous bee-like creatures created by the capital. Um, And so she ends up breaking a nest down on the careers, uh, getting stung herself. Rue uh, brings her back to health and a few, and uh, they start working together. What ends up happening is, um, sorry, I lost myself in my notes. Uh, what ends up happening is that they uh, they start to a lot uh, they become allies, but Rue is fatally wounded by someone from District One, and Katniss destroys the career's supplies uh, while she destroys the career supplies. Katniss kills Rue's killer with an arrow, and really sits by her while Rue dies, uh, building her a shrine full of flowers, singing to her. Uh, much like she used to do her sister as they end up refusing to let the capital take her body. Uh, Then all of a sudden, a rule change is announced. And instead of one surviving victor, there can be two as long as they are from the same district, which automatically all of a sudden makes Katniss be like, whoa, I can win this with PETA. So she goes and tries to find them, discovers that he has been injured. uh, And so she nurses him back to health. But then, like, realizing that she can't do this on her own, she per- starts to begin to pretend to be madly in love with PETA in order to get those sponsors' monies, baby! Um, and the game makers, uh, or the, the, they are able to receive some help, but not enough. So what happens is that the game makers set up a trap and or trick where they can go and get the medicine that they need for PETA, but they'll have to face and risk the other tributes 
She is almost killed by Clove, who is a career tribute from District 2, uh, gl- who gloats over Rue's death, but that results in Rue's part- district partner ending up killing her. Uh, he later dies, unfortunately. Uh, the medicine saves Peta's life. Peta's over the moon, very much in love with Katniss, who's struggling internally to be like, hey, <laughs> this is all a game, right? Uh, all of a sudden, after some genetically enhanced wolves and a really tragic death for the last two, Katniss and Peta become the last two survivors, and the game makers change their minds, saying that there can only be one victor after all. Katniss does not like this, and instead of finding a way to survive, decides that maybe it's best if we just kill ourselves. As they prepare to do that, the game makers realize that this would be a really bad for optics uh, and announce them both the winners. Uh, they both have sort of the welcoming, you won, congratulations, victory tour. But Katniss is warned by Hamish that the Capitol may take action against her for her defiance. Uh, and Peta is heartbroken to learn that everything that happened in the games between the two of them was simply part of a ploy to gain sympathy and sponsors. And Katniss is unsure of the world she is returning home to. Dun, dun, dun. So dun, dun, dun. it's tragedy all the way through, you guys. Oh, it's tragedy all the way through. Teenage I was like trying angst, to exactly blue. <laughs> teenage angst. I was trying to. It's not even angst. Here's the thing. Teenage angst, I feel like, does a disservice, right? Because we're just like, oh man, they're so angsty. Like, this is legit trauma. I was trying to come up with a high point where I was like, and then there was this happy moment where everything seemed safe. Nothing seemed safe ever. Nope. It was like a steady decline downhill. You, it just was terrible. I think the only really nice moment in this book is whenever Katniss and Rue are hanging out eating the rabbit. That's bad. Yeah, it. <laughs> but like even that, you're just like, man, these two kids, if they're friends, one of them's gonna die. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like this is, and also like Katniss and Rue's friendship and relationship are is definitely because we never got to see her with Primrose, but mm-hmm. it's that same sort of relationship. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it's terrible. Yeah. Would have loved like to see these media. kids. With so- <laughs> yes. Uh, it would have been fascinating. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So um, there is, this book is told from Katniss's point of view. So we really only get to see her perspective, but there are, we would say, about five main characters. So we'd like to go ahead and break those characters down um, so we can talk just a little bit about them in specific before we get into some of the broader uh, things in regards to this particular book. So first, we're going to start with Katniss herself. So we're going to talk a lot more about Katniss later, um, Mm -hmm. but just I just want to talk a little bit about how if you've not read the books, if you've only seen the movies, what is probably missing for a lot of people is that the book truly is like just Katniss's perspective. You get privy to all of her thoughts. So when Jennifer Lawrence is like sitting there and just blankly staring at Peta in the books, there's like this whole freaking monologue, right? Where Katniss is saying, I feel this and I think this and this happened in the past. You know, so the book is really this glimpse into Katniss and Katniss is a character that I think works best in books. She is a very Mm -hmm. cerebral character. She spends a lot of time analyzing what's going on around her, discussing her feelings. She is very in touch with herself. She is incredibly authentic. So when she is, when she's being the star of this book, you really have a narrator that you can truly trust. There's a lot of like unreliable narrators you know that's like a thing in fiction hunger games is not that hunger games has like the most reliable narrator you know what katniss is telling you is from her perspective exactly what happened she's not lying to herself (laughs) at all that is her character that's how she is (laughs) she um which is refreshing because i also think that the thing with that is that she is one of the most authentic 16 year old girls that i have read in um in fiction especially in ya fiction uh that especially one that has gone through a large amount of trauma 
Uh, you get every, I don't trust this person's thought. You get every, like, she's nice, but I don't particularly like her. You get all of those insights that is truly part of being in a person's mind. Mm-hmm. And because of that, man, is she unlikable. That's <laughs> true. So we're going to go into a lot more detail on this later, but but spoilers for a moment. The reason why I still believe that Katniss is a very believable 16-year-old, despite being so authentic and so reliable, is she's kind of a bitch, you guys. You might not remember this because Jennifer Lawrence is so goddamn charismatic, you, you kind of forget when you watch the movie, but reread the book if you haven't in a minute. Katniss is, Katniss is not a nice person. She really is not. <laughs> she's not. And she doesn't need to be. No, like except for her. and but and also like it, it we're gonna get into it so i don't want to talk too much about it i will get on that rampage and i'm going to wait for it uh but yes no she's it's she it's an interesting character uh yeah. and i know that that was one of the biggest critiques of people who really liked J law's version of her and really liked the media presented version of her and then read the books and was like what mm-hmm mm-hmm <laughs> Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're going to just put a pin in all of that. Just know for this who's who section, Katniss gets her whole, her whole little thing in a minute. So next, um, I can't remember who's next. There it is. It's Gail. It's Gail. Gail, Gail, um, sir, barely appearing in this book. (laughs) Sir, barely appearing in the entire series. (laughs) Gail. Blink blink and you don't see him. I mean, if you're a Gail fan, I'm sorry to say but um, it's just because he's pretty. That's the only reason that he is nothing. He doesn't do anything in this book. <laughs> Gail is mentioned so much more as a thought that Katniss has than as a character doing anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the reason why Gail is even considered a main character in this is because of how often Katniss does think of him. Mm-hmm. She, he's her only friend. Basically, uh, he's another boy in the district that grew up in a very similar situation as she did, as far as poverty written, having to be the serv- like having to be the provider for, uh, her- for their family. Mm-hmm. The and main because, thing they- oh, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead, you can finish, finish. Your I was thought. like, and because of that, they trauma bonded. Yeah, they had a relationship based on an understanding of the way that the world worked for them. And that, that that relationship was incredibly important because it made it made Katniss not feel alone. And it also gave Katniss the permission to sit there and be like, I'm going to volunteer, take care of Prim for me. Yep. Yep. The whole point of Gail's character is because we need a way to show how Katniss provides for her family and her doing it all alone would be very freaking boring. Yes. So we have Gail, who also hunts and is in a very similar situation to Katniss, where he has siblings and parents that he actually takes care of. And um, and then because of that, like once you introduce this character, it's a, you feel the urge to do some more with him, right? So then also we have this little bit where Gail is like, you know, this was before the reaping before um, Katniss ends up going to the games where he's like, you know, Katniss, what would be really cool? Like, what if we just ran away together and started over and Katniss is like, <laughs> that's a real funny joke, Gail. And then, um, and then during the game, she kind of reflects back on that and is like, huh, should I have done that? Maybe he's serious. Maybe he's trying to tell me he has feelings for me. Oh my gosh. I wish I would have pulled that thread a little more when we had that conversation, but I'm kind of a bitch. So I didn't dang it. Now I'm in this really awkward situation. And I don't even know if I'm ever going to see him again. So that's basically Gail is those kind of two plot points. And that's really all that exists for his character. You don't really understand Gail's motivations outside of the fact that he has certain motivations that are the same as Katniss's motivations. You can make some assumptions about him, but we really don't like hear Gail tell Katniss too much about that other than he hates the Capitol. That's all he really does is say to Katniss how much he hates the Capitol. I think also like Gail provides a great opportunity to see Katniss before Mm -hmm. um, and to be reminded throughout the series of what Katniss was before. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Because this event so not like it is so common in YA for things to not change characters for big events to not affect characters in any which way uh, and to not change them 
to the point that they would have. That doesn't happen in the Hunger Games. Mm-hmm. Katniss, <laughs> Katniss in the second book and in the third book is a completely different person. She becomes a completely different person within the games. We have the privilege of watching that happen. And so what Gail really provides for us is a glimpse and understanding of who she was before and a reminder in these next upcoming books of what she, of what she was before all of this. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, what the Hunger Games Gail, took from her. Because Gail doesn't really change because Gail goes through his own stuff. Mm-hmm. But it's certainly not what Katniss goes through. No. Uh, Bree says, I feel like that speaks to a lot of teenage crushes. You think about them way more than than they ever were there. Bree, it's so true. And that is it's exactly so what Gail is. Gail is literally like um he's he's kind of he i want to say that uh that he's like some kind of romantic interest but he really isn't y'all he's not um spoilers next week we're going to talk about love triangles so have fun with that and we're going to talk about hunger games in relation to those love triangles um but i'm here to say since we're talking about gail for a moment uh there's really not a love triangle in hunger games that Mm -hmm. katniss katniss is about as aromantic as you could possibly get and any romantic feelings she might have ever had the trauma of the games totally took away her ability to ever have them that this book is these books are zero romance absolutely zero there isn't any (laughs) there isn't any romance is a is a, a, a something the capital made up for her i will say that there's complicated feelings of like like bond and expectations of relationships but Mm -hmm. it's never it's never like she deeply feels about anybody um but like yeah i just wanted to is gail is a what if gail is the anxiety thoughts in the middle of the night sitting there and being like what if i had chosen something different Mm -hmm. it's like not even a oh should i have explored that more it's just like a what if i did what if I did run away with him? What if we yeah. did, were able to escape? Like that's, it's about the possibility of how to get out of this current situation by regretting past actions. Mm-hmm. And if that idea interests you, then make sure you're here when we talk about the third book, because we're going to go yes. all up into it in the third <laughs> book. <laughs> <laughs> um, but next, let's talk about the character who's actually present in this book. It's Peta. Oh, let's see if I can click on the right thing. There we go. Pita, there we Pita go. Peta, bread boy. So bread, bread boy is boy. actually featured in these books. <laughs> and bread boy is featured in these books. Bread boy has feelings for Katniss because she's a pretty 16 year old girl and he is an awkward boy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who is. <laughs> I mean, it, it's so funny. mom treats him very poorly and Kat yeah. treats him very poorly. <laughs> it's so funny because Peta has this one line that he says to Hamish where he's like, you see, she she doesn't understand what she does to people. And because it's from Katniss's perspective, we have no idea what Hamish's reaction is. But I assume Hamish's reaction is like, brah, it just you. <laughs> it's just you. Because like truly, truly like... Peta creates this crush on Katniss from like the way she introduces herself in like Which, freaking kindergarten first grade like their their version of starting school like he does he doesn't know anything about her he's never hung out with her he just observes her and thinks which she's again cool. which again very accurate for 16 year old boy yeah. man is that a commentary on the trope that we are used to with this Mm-hmm. We are so used to a boy in YA in this particular situation who has loved a girl all of his life secretly and has not been willing to tell her until she has found like the beauty within herself or whatever, right? That's like like one of the freaking tropes of friends to friends to lovers. That <laughs> that's not what's happening here. All of the same ingredients, different bread. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> different recipe <laughs> yep and uh and we'll talk about this in a moment but um Peta's mom is also a bitch and yeah. the the crush that he gets is on um the class bitch so yeah. like that's real funny i feel freud, really bad for Peta. i feel like freud would really appreciate Peta. <laughs> freud would really appreciate Peta. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, i think he would <laughs> I think he'd have a lot to say about Mr. Peter Malark. <laughs> I he would. Uh, I think that. Um, however, I was talking about gentle characters earlier. I I do think that it's very interesting that 
Peta is also a more gentle character than all the mm-hmm. other characters we we see. Uh, he is a very feely boy. He is a very emotionally aware boy. Uh, and he he has a lot of those like deep feelings. He he is very not what a YA love interest typically was during this era. True. True. Um, he ain't no Byronic man. Let me just put it like that. <laughs> and Katniss hates it. <laughs> she and Katniss does. hates that. Yeah. Uh, again, the the vulnerability of like letting gentleness in. Uh, and what's also really fascinating is that like we get to see Peta's growth alongside mm-hmm. Peta because Katniss goes through the same thing. Uh, Peta does not come out the games the same either. Yeah. Um, hey Ninja, how you doing? Bree, yeah, I no. totally agree. They're head in they're very head and heart trope vibes. So here's the yeah. thing with PETA that's great is we don't ever need to get a Hunger Games from PETA's perspective, because PETA just tells us what his perspective is. Yes. Like he's he definitely is like that more outspoken character, the more in touch with his feelings, but he's very authentic too. And I think that's why um Peta and Katniss are able to work together so well is that even though Katniss doesn't speak how she feels exactly she is very authentic and Peta is also very authentic like with both of them you feel like you trust them you know exactly what they're gonna do and you trust that they're gonna behave exactly how they have presented themselves so far so you can very easily predict their behaviors I think the most uh unrealistic part of like being a teenager these characters being teenagers is their amazing communication skills <laughs> they're very good at just being like this is what i mean when i say this thing they both <laughs> are really good at that uh, they don't they need therapy for everything else not that though <laughs> mm-hmm. how perception wasn't reality yeah for sure exactly ninja yeah Peta, exactly. Peta's too smart you know Peta. Peta's too smart for a kiddo <laughs> He is. And and I think that like, yeah, you and I think it's also very realistic. I think it's very interesting that we see this concept of like somebody having a crush on a character where it's like, yo, bro, it's not that deep. Like, yes, you saved my life. And my weird feelings have to do with like this, this oh my gosh cat <laughs> this he, feeling of he like cat feeling wants attention. Like, he wants attention <laughs> of feeling like i owe you and that's what like katniss is going from and, and Peter's like sitting here being like i am in love with the thing that i think you are mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's where my weird feelings come from <laughs> mm-hmm. yep exactly So in addition to those three, there are two adults that we would consider like main characters. So we want to talk just a little bit about those guys as well. First being the lovely Haymitch. Oh my God. Here's the thing. I, they never go into Haymitch's tragedy in the movie because it doesn't matter. You just know that he obviously was traumatized. The games, the games are traumatizing enough. Mm Mm-hmm. I need to tell you about this man's backstory because I think people don't understand it to the point that it is where it's like, oh, this poor boy was in the 20, was in a quarter quell where they picked double the amount of tributes. So four boys or four girls, two, two girls and two boys from each district. He did what he could to survive and was fine. Ended up being top five with a girl from his district. Ended up having to, like, watch her die. Mm -hmm. Ended up being top two. One uh, for luck, but was not happy about winning. So the capital was just like, oh, you're not happy about this and you're not willing to play our game? I'm going to kill your friends, family, and girlfriend within two weeks, accidentally, within two weeks Mm -hmm. of you winning. So that not only has he gone through this traumatizing event, but he has lost everything else in his life. And then he has to spend the next 25 years watching two kids board the train and die over and over and over again. No wonder this man drinks. I would also just be a lush waiting for my ultimate demise. And that would, you know, I would also do the same thing because here's, here's the thing with Hamish. I mean, clearly he's like a glimpse into Katniss and Peeta's future, right? That's mm-hmm. the that's the point of his character. And I don't think Suzanne Collins had this whole thing planned. I don't think she knew. I think she was just like um 
Well, we'll talk about her in a second. I think she yes, was just I like, agree, oh, absolutely. obviously, uh, this guy's traumatized. I-, I don't know how yet. I'll figure it out later. But the trauma that is heaped onto him is absolutely insane. It shows the absolute viciousness of the Capitol. And it's so, so bad that, um, yeah, I like, same, well, bro. Like, if it was me, also- I would also just drink until I died. We'll see this a lot more in this next book because we'll learn a lot more about ca- other characters' traumas that they've gone through. Mm-hmm. But the way that these tr- like traumatic events and these this heavy survival is just dropped into the narrative is so casual. Mm-hmm. Like this story was just like Katniss reminiscing on it. <laughs> yeah, and you know. And you know that Hamish goes into each of these, like, knowing that there's absolutely no point in mentoring these yeah. kids because the chances of them surviving is, like, so tiny. It's so infinitesimally tiny He's... in from their district um, since they're so impoverished um, and the way that they c- compete in these games. Like, it's just not going to – so, like, what's the point? Let's just, you know, obliterate my brain. And I just he – he's probably, out of all of the characters, um, the most tragic – of yeah. everybody's story that we get in these books. Yes. Winning the games will not make you happy. Yeah. So well, like um we'll talk we'll, we're getting to the whole we're going to get to the whole world in a second. So I'm going to put a pin in what you just said um Zasu cuz I have I have a comment on that. Uh but yes, Hamish is the character that shows us that absolutely. Yes. All right. And then we have Hamish's opposite. Again, we have so many foils within this, like two characters that are opposite of each other that show aspects of one another. Uh, we have the other mentor, which is the complete opposite of Hamish, which is Effie, mm-hmm. Effie Trinket, uh, who is this vibrant, fashionable young woman uh, who is considered a like expert who is supposed to help the help navigate Tita and Katniss into the world of the capital and like facilitate things and conversations between the capital and between Katniss and and uh Pita. It's her first time doing this. They're she's they're her first you know victor or not victors but first uh tributes so she's very excited she's grown up in the capital she's never really known the world i think i can't remember but i think that like this is the first time out of the capital when she goes to district 12 so she has yeah, no I, idea what she's doing she it's it's heavily implied that like she just graduated college and this is her first big girl job and she's so excited yes. and she's gonna do her best as best as best at her first big girl job like that's that's what's implied is going on with her character yes and and that she has no concept of how other districts live or what life is like. She has been so indoctrinated by her privilege and her experience in the capital that the concept of living outside of any sort of life like that has never really been introduced to her. And so meeting these characters, she's just so excited to to she's like, this is a this is the Hunger Games. This is amazing. And she's very, she's very believable, believing of the, of the propaganda. Um, and she doesn't know like the human sides of like, she has no concept yet that Katniss is like a human, that PETA is a human. Uh, and so we have someone who is so thrilled and excited to be here. That is so new to this concept who hasn't been ruined by the trauma yet and is excited to be there. That is also like helping mentor them at the same time that we have Hamish, who is just traumatized beyond belief. Mm -hmm. Because from Effie's perspective, it's kind of like, oh, you know, I've been given District 12 because I I don't really have enough experience with this sort of thing. So I'm given the crappy district and we're probably going to lose. But I'm going to try my best because I really want that promotion, even though cleaning toilets is crappy. I'm, I'm going to be manager someday. Like that's the energy that she's got, you it's know, so, so so she's very excited. And she thinks I think she genuinely believes that her kids have a chance. I think, yeah, I think and I think that she that she thinks that this is this is a joy. Like that's the other thing too is that Effie is an insight into the capital that we don't really see, because what we see of the capital is of the production side of behind the scenes. We need a glimpse of what the final product is being put out looks like, and Effie is that. 
Effie sees the Hunger Games as this big, fantastical, amazing event where everything is wonderful, where, where, oh, aren't you so glad that you could eat all these wonderful foods and experience this wonderful stuff and, and everything is great and this is amazing and we're celebrating you. This is a celebration. And it isn't until, like, even though she grew up watching the games of children murdering each other, it, it didn't matter because it was it wasn't her and it was just in the concept of this is a celebration mm -hmm. and so we are able to see that as readers of like oh this is what the this is how the capital views this even though we're only experiencing the backside production of everything this is what the capital sees in all of this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh which yeah. is necessary because again everything's from Katniss's point of view within the books so we don't get these small little glimpses of the audience we don't get the like that we did in the movies we don't get these like small little vignettes of like what's happening outside and the discussions that are happening mm -hmm. uh effie is our only connection to what is the capital like mm -hmm. yeah totally exactly ninja for these two characters and um and i just remember like when the hungry Games books were, were like coming out and it was like the hotness or whatever right everyone was like shipping these two together everyone wanted like the I, effie, I ha it. effie <laughs> hamish to become a romance like um so so much fic so much fic <laughs> i'm a monster this is this is the trope that i love i get it it yeah. would never actually happen but man am i reading a fan fiction about it yeah yeah book it's so, one it's everywhere <laughs> no this is a book book three ship for me this is not yeah. a book one ship for me but people were doing it back in book one they were <laughs> can't do that back in book they're two they're two different they were they were though so yeah so those are our main characters of the um hunger games of the first book uh there are other characters but they really aren't consequential they are all kind of um there for various plot reasons right like these five these are really our main characters that uh that matter right so now that we have talked about the characters, we've talked about the plot, we, you know, everybody's up to speed on on that. We'd like to next talk a little bit about the history of uh, genre that Hunger Games um, brought to, to YA. Because who remembers, somebody, I think Blue said it earlier in the chat, like once Hunger Games got popular, all of a sudden, e there was like... 50 different like YA dystopias out there. Like it was an well, absolute explosion of so dystopia and YA. I think Hunger Games did this thing of also like Harry Potter. One time is a fluke, making a worldwide renown, renown story. One time is a fluke. Second time is an accident. Third time is a sure thing. So we had Harry Potter come in with number one, changing the world, opening up this entire genre of literature of the concept of YA being a bigger, better thing uh, that all of a sudden that authors could access it, that these different kinds of stories could be told in fun ways, that you could have almost a romance version of YA, that the, that the fictional and non the fictional fantasy speculative and also uh, like realistic fiction can explain can explode targeted towards that audience harry potter brought that then all of a sudden the romance genre within that genre exploded when when twilight brought that and that took over the world even more so in some ways everyone and everywhere was talking about it and then all of a sudden hunger games comes along and does the exact same thing so for the industry it's like okay ya is where it's at and how you do this is you make large movie productions and you base it around romance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so the publishing industry was like anything that has a combination of these three things, you got to have, you got to have two, you got to have magic, dystopia, or romance, pick two and you get it published. Mm -hmm. And the, and the, and Hollywood was looking at it going any series that involves a boy and girl meeting and vaguely falling in love and having to survive will push it out mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it will be a success and it was like suddenly the market was flooded with this bullshit but this is the problem uh, with with all the ones that came after hunger games hunger games from the outset was clearly clearly had um suzanne's collins political thoughts in it. Now, the books don't really get super overtly political until the third one. So we'll talk about that more when we get there. 
Um, but it's clear even from the first book that Suzanne Collins is going, hey, um, America's got some problems, you guys. America's got some problems. And I think there's some problems here. (laughs) Capitalism might be evil, guys. Capitalism and like exploiting others that are poorer than you might be a bad thing. (laughs) Yeah, like maybe we shouldn't all just be competing for to the death to um, to be one of the one percent on top. Maybe we shouldn't be doing that. Maybe competition's bad for us, you guys. Maybe the um, only way to do that is to break the whole system down. Yeah, so there so is like, no there is no winning. <laughs> so like, pub- because publishers were so hungry for more of this, what you ended up with was um, all of these books where the first book was set up some kind of like, oh, we're going to talk about politics. But the authors didn't take the time to actually make sure they had a coherent political idea to put in. And um, so then kind of what happened is you had all these series where the first book was awesome. And then by the third book, you were like, why the fuck did I waste my time? (laughs) Divergent. Awful, awful (laughs) series of books. Maze Runner, same thing. Mm -hmm. And and, and like if whatever one popped in your head, right? The same Same thing. thing. I bet it had a fantastic opener. And then by the third book, you were like, why the fuck did I waste my time? Because they weren't thinking about it that way. Also, welcome in, Aria. Hello. Um, Aria is one of my my good friends from the cafe, finally here in the Twitch. So let's all say um, a big welcome to Aria. Welcome. (laughs) Not the Maze Runner slander. Y'all, okay. Sucks. Friends, it sucks. Reread it. Does not hold up. You liked it. No, here's the deal. You liked Maze Runner because you had finished Hunger Games and you got sad about it. And you wanted to find something that itched the same thing that wasn't a reread. That's why you liked Maze Runner. You don't actually like Maze Runner. I guarantee it. That's also why I really liked Divergent. And I really didn't get mad at it until the second half of the third book. And then I got really mad. The only thing, the only thing that I will sit there and say that Divergent did uh, was the concept of character survival. I don't know if we'll yeah, ever yeah, talk yeah. about Divergent. So um, I don't know. But, I don't know if we'll ever talk about like, it. Like it changed the game in terms of like the rules there, but you had to go through a lot of bullshit to get there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when it comes to these like YA dystopias, none of them hit the way Hunger Games does. And the reason why they don't is because there is no coherent political ideology like underlining it, even though they're all trying to talk about politics. But it's really hard, as as we learned from our Harry Potter analysis, it's really hard to talk about politics when you, the author, do not have a coherent political ideology that you actually truly believe in. Um, so yeah, it's kind of hard to do. <laughs> so hard. It's so hard. Uh, no, it's, uh, it's just, I think that there was a sense of like, what made Hunger Games so amazing is that it spoke to kids like they were adults, even though it was targeted at kids, which means it didn't, it didn't undersell the concept of the, any of the politics. It like just presented it in a way that kids didn't necessarily need the reference that is to understand. They understood that the rich people of the world were exploiting the poor people of the world. And that there were some aspects of people in between there that like had the privilege of going to school to do this and still having to like be in a competition with the people who didn't. Um, they don't need to know about class. They don't need to have college level classes in classism to understand that in racism, to understand that in, in any sort of, they don't even need to have any concept of any sort of money politics to understand why that is bad. And to also feel empathy and understanding and like be, and even putting themselves in that place. I guarantee you that every single kid like either imagined that could, that was like, had that creative skill of wanting to imagine themselves in the world already put themselves in the place of where they felt they probably related to the most and how they would have felt fit into the world Mm -hmm. so like you had middle class kids putting themselves into career positions and talking about like dismantling the games you had kids from impoverished schools putting themselves in positions that related to district 12 or district 11 and then how they would fight in the games you probably had kids who imagined themselves being in the capital and figuring out how they were going to dismantle the games Mm -hmm. they didn't need the experience and the expertise of politics to connect to it 
And Susan Collins didn't shy away because of that. Every author that followed treated every single person that read their books like children who didn't have the capability of understanding yeah and therefore didn't need to think that deep about it yeah yeah no, and that's, that's why say, everything felt hollow <laughs> yep and that's not to say like you know brie if you enjoyed maze runner right that there's not things to like about those books yeah but they absolutely. ain't no hunger games they ain't no hunger games and, and um, on the and so, yeah. especially when especially when like focusing on the political mm-hmm. explanation of the world Mm-hmm, right mm-hmm. um and and also like recognizing that knowing who brie is recognizing that she has a very different uh experience because she lives in a different political society than what we are based like here in america are based off of it's an american book directed towards mostly an american audience all i know canada is not that different but there could also be like where we connect to it more there yeah maybe yeah for sure but but i think like that's the important thing of like this is also an example of what made this Hunger Games successful was how Susan Collins treated her readers before they even read it. They didn't undermine it, whereas every other author from that point on that took this did. They went, this is children's literature. It's not that deep. Yeah. Yeah. But it could be. Hunger Games is kind of deep. And it should be. And we, and we see the success of what happens when it is. Right. Your movies are already better than Maze Runner, so I imagine the books are definitely better too. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't wait for you to read them, Brie. You really should. I think you would like them. Especially no, if you liked like Maze Runner, you will love Hunger Games. Mm-hmm. Like, is good. So yeah, in addition to talking about how this affected um, our world, we would like to talk a little bit about the world of Pan Am itself. So the way that the Hunger Games works is it's kind of like this near future situation um, of like um, America, Canada, Canada, Mexico, like North America, quote unquote. Um, Much of it is underwater because this is a post climate catastrophe world. And I will tell you first, the best thing about Pan Am, the best thing is when Suzanne Collins was asked, what about the rest of the world? She goes, I don't know, because everyone in Pan Am believes everyone else died and then refuses to talk about it further queen absolute queen shit thank you absolutely for not expanding would, where it didn't need to be expanded happen. <laughs> yes. so good so good uh didn't didn't have to pry didn't want to and also applaud her for not for not then expanding for not being like you know what it's been 10 years since i've written a book you know what i'm gonna do i'm going to go explore what they did over in europe no she just did a prequel which i'm not angry about mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but not that angry about it yep <laughs> And thank you. There's there's tons of different maps you can find, by the way, of, of Pan Am. This one yes. is from um, a website called Pan Am Propaganda. So this is fan art. So I want to say thank you very much to the people that put this out because it's an absolutely gorgeous map. I do and, love the concept of it being called Gulf of District 11. That right? Like, but wouldn't so, it be? I'm just, like, be? I'm just like, I don't know if it would be. Maybe. Oh, sorry. We're going backwards. I tried to Ooh, zoom in. This is what happened. There time, we go. Back in time. Um, hey, Kawaii. So yeah, we have, uh, you know what, it would be the district level because you know what, hey, y'all, I'm a district 11 girly, as y'all know, that's where I'm from. That's my place. District um, 13 rep or capital, either yeah, one. No, I, I think I'm extremes here. <laughs> well, yeah, you're in the wild. So I guess you would be well, district 13. No, huh? I would be district 13. Yeah, yeah, yeah right you would be old district 13. Uh, but where I grew up, capital, baby. <laughs> Oh is... yeah, that's true. You're in the we were in the Rockies. I was the Man, Rockies. <laughs> this explains so much. <laughs> um, that was my role. I uh, broke free of the Capitol and I went to District 13. No, just kidding. Uh, so, yeah, but yeah, we can we can. I I think that there is something to be said about how like the idea of there's a capital and you divide everyone into these really neat. 13 districts and somehow the economy still functions like okay i know the economy wouldn't really function like, but you got la 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 i don't want to hear it that's not the point okay the point is not to be to recreate a hyper realistic economy i don't think suzanne collins cares about that mm-hmm. all that she's trying to say is that the powers it be love to divide us and make us fight each other that's the reason the districts exist I to also- me this is very clear I also think that there's an interesting concept here of like 
just a callback of the 13 original colonies being Mm -hmm. a very American thing, going back Mm -hmm. to the beginning that we're rewriting, that we're following the same mistakes. Like, like I think that there is, there is a connection there too, that I think is really cool in American history. Um, It it, it might not like it. The moreover point is that like, Oh, separation based on the agriculture in which you live and the importance of that product to the wealthy. Like mm-hmm. that is the overall point. But the fact that there's 13. Well, I think the 13 you know, has two fun things, cool. right? So it's 13 colonies, like you said, that's true. Um, I think the other fun thing about it being 13 districts is kind of like 13 is an unlucky number and they got mm-hmm. rid of the 13. So like, we're going to be prosperous now for the next 75 years yes. is kind of basically what happened. And I, I like that too. Like it's very nice and symbolic. Yes. So to and me, I- the the fact that I know that this wouldn't really work in an economic sense doesn't matter so much because it works so well liter- literarily yes. that I forgive. <laughs> and also she never dug into it. Yeah. Like I mean, again, haven't we haven't read the songbird the the songbirds and ballads, whatever. Uh, I should know it, but I don't. Often it's got like ballad of songbirds and snakes or something like yeah, that. Something I think like that, that might be right. Uh, so she might get into how the world is developed in that, and then we can open for criticism on it. The reality is, is that she never did. Yeah, we don't talk about she supply chains. Tried. We don't talk about Pan Am supply chains. Uh, and because she never tried and is willing to admit that she didn't have it all planned out, unlike the author that shall not be named, uh, there is like a level of like, okay, cool. This is the world you want me to exist in. You didn't try to overthink it. You didn't try to oversell that. You know, everything that ever happened in it. Amazing. I'm here for a good time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, but yeah, no, I, and I think that also like just back to the, uh, just the original 13 colonies i also love like the concept of like oh it's the 13 original colonies and also all of their resources all of the things that they are discovering is going to somewhere else which is very much call back to like england ruling over everything mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. i think that that's an interesting like connection yep. as well yep and it is it is kind of funny that it all that it all goes back to like random town in the rockies you know yeah <laughs> <laughs> well, like and then back to random town in the Rockies that couldn't possibly exist if it weren't for everybody funneling resources to them. Yes. Like, and then also like um I wanted to pull up a list here of like I I also appreciate how the districts are not necessarily ordered by one and importance of like how important they are to or that they're that not how close they are in proximity to the capital but rather how important mm-hmm. uh the capital deems them or how valuable the things that they produce are mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so things like district one yes it, it's right up beside the capital but it's not i mean we're up here in canada up at the top uh where that's like luxury goods District two is like rock quarrying, which is like important. Uh, and then district three is like electrical goods manufacturing. So obviously all of these things necessary for the lifestyle that the capital holds. Whereas when we get to district 12, which is coal mining is power, but is seen as something that is so like expected at this point in time that it's an afterthought. And that's mm-hmm. also like what represents of like the wealth of district 12. Yeah, I mean, it's it's no mistake that the southeast districts, the two districts of the southeast are textiles and agriculture. And then the yeah. district of the Appalachians is coal mining, something considered very dirty. Like, that's not a mistake. That is no, 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 no. that is clear. Uh, but also like how it's ranked in terms of like how someone deems it, appro- how appropriate and important they deem it. Mm-hmm. So like even then, District 11 is crops. Well, food in the capital is an expectation so of course like in terms of like how the capital would rank it it's low because they've always had it Mm -hmm. they can't imagine a world without it Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh Mm -hmm. same thing with like you know and and then and, and the same thing with power and stuff like that livestock again going with the food concept i think that that not only is it where the locations of each of these districts are and why that makes sense, but also like then being like, okay, this is the, this is the, this is the order of importance to us. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Um, and one of the things in regards, and this will kind of segue into the next part of what we want to talk about, but one of the things I find the most interesting is the difference between the way the peacekeepers in Katniss's District 12 act versus the peacekeepers in Rue's District 11 act and how she talks about how much harsher they are on District 11. And that makes a lot of sense to me because if you imagine District 11 um, really is very uh, important, even though the Capitol treats them as if they're not, the truth is without District 11, everything else doesn't work because they don't have food to eat. You cannot survive on corn alone, sorry. Nope. Um, so we have uh, we have this situation where we cannot, absolutely cannot have any rebellion or rule breaking in District 11, whereas in District 12, eh, you can go outside the fence to hunt a little bit. It really doesn't matter that much. You know, it's not a big deal, but in District 11, it's a huge deal. And I really, um, as somebody from the Southeast, I read this, and uh, and I go, yep, no, that's how it would be. Yes, that's yeah. how it would be. What could also be written into that? The mm. fact that in mm. the Southeast, there is where most of the food is grown by late un unwilling labor with harsher laws on them. Why is that? Sound familiar, kinda, Karen? Kind of feels know. like she might be talking a little bit about the real world gerrymandering that happens to us who live in the Southeast. I don't know, Landon, oh. but it just kind of maybe sounds a little bit like that. It might also, yeah, and like there's lots of similarities there to slavery and how uh, the larger proportion of Black people living in the in that part of the country are treated more are treated more poorly than like the, the higher popularity of white people uh, that live in the more northeast. I'm not saying that Black people don't live in District 12, but I am saying that like certainly, given where our current uh, population dis distributions are uh that the, the this the, the district 11 would be far more uh diverse than district 12 would be you know we're gonna talk more about this in the the movie episode so put put a pin in that um but yeah rue and thresh were always black in the books they ah. rue did not become black in the movie so if you remember it that way that you read no. you read that crap on twitter she was always black and so was thresh so. And so was a large part, like a large, there was a whole lot of things about like people sitting there and being like, oh, well, you know, they just made everybody from District 11 black to make us think about things. It was like, no, no, in the, the books, the people who live there would be black. <laughs> no, in the books, it is like this. And it is um very explicitly uh, commenting about slavery and what we did in this country to those people during the slave trade and how we have continued to treat their descendants that's what it's about yes. so yes it you know is. oh yep but we'll talk so, about that more in the movie episode but it's so fortunate because we're going to talk about it at least a little bit in this episode yes we're done with talking about the world we can move on to uh classes of racism and other isms that exist yep. in this world so in addition to the little aside we had about District 11, we can't forget that District 12 is considered one of the very, very poor districts. And let's remember that Appalachia today in this country is very poor. Now, it is not as populated with minorities as the Southeast is. Appalachia is relatively white, not completely, of course, but relatively. Um, but, uh, but it's very poor. And let's not forget, okay, let's not forget that white people, rich white people, hate poor white people, sometimes more than they hate other minorities, because when they see a poor white person, they think to themselves, well, you didn't try hard enough. You didn't try hard enough. Like, if you've ever seen, if you know anybody that, uh, that really heavily identifies with their whiteness, um, and they see a story about like um, a, a cop having violence against another white person. They don't think like, wow, they're doing it against me too, those evil cops. No, they think he did he he deserved that for some reason. He should have been more polite to the cop. Oh, that sucks to be him. They don't think that could have been me. They think that sucks to be him. And that is why District 12 is the way it is in Hunger Games. It's the same thing. I also think that like people are, are more willing to be uh, outspoken against that because there isn't the heavy uh, 
because racism is considered uh bad it is i should say that but like morally people don't want to be considered morally people don't think themselves as bad so they don't want to be considered bad even though they are racist because they're gaining off of the system based on racism uh but nobody wants to sit there and be like i'm gonna say a thing unless you're truly terrible no one's Mm -hmm. gonna sit there and be like i'm gonna say a thing that's going to actually make me look like a racist because no one wants to be accused of being a racist Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. classism is built into our society and considered okay (laughs) and while classism and racism have a lot of overlap again you have that that percentage of white poor people that are then okay to be verbally publicly hated upon Mm -hmm. by rich white people because it's not racist to do that and also I'm not that. So I'm going, like, if you didn't, you could have just picked yourself up by the bootstraps and gotten out. That's what they think. And you see this in the Hunger Games. This is very explicit. And it's even explained in the visual, which it, this didn't happen in the movie. And I'll explain why in a, in a moment. But you have people from what's called the seam, which is mm-hmm. like the poor part of District 12. And then you have the merchant class, which is the rich part of District 12. So um, Primrose and Katniss's mother was a merchant class girl and their father um, was a seam boy. They get married. They have Katniss, who looks like she's from the seam, and Primrose, who looks like she's of the merchant class, right? So the difference, and Katniss describes this, there is a visual difference between the merchant class people and the seam people. And Katniss and the other seam people are all described as gray. Gray eyes, Mm. gray hair, gray skin, gray. Y'all, it's only been about a little over 100 years since present day. And they already are racializing these seam people by calling them gray people. Okay. And In the movies, you don't get this because all the District 12 people are white because what the heck does a gray person even look like? That's not a racial category that exists in our world. So how the heck would you cast it? You wouldn't. Um, I know a lot of fan casts uh, say that that's Native American. You could do that. I don't think that's what's happening in the books. I think in the books, what Suzanne Collins is actually saying is that these seam people have been racialized and there is a new race of poor whites, gray people. Okay. It's a, it's a, cause that's like how racism started. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Was it, it had nothing to, if you look at the racism universally, it very little has to do with like, like this is it's obviously like oh we're gonna differentiate between two skin colors or something we can differentiate between but like if you look at it on the greater scheme of things racism is a is a human like concept but like if you look at india india did the same thing where they they took like took people that looked very similar and like made distinctions based off of that mm-hmm. or uh yeah it just we do that today. So a good example of where today. it's happened yeah. today is um, is Latin people, people from Mexico, Central America, and South America being considered another race, which think about it for a second, that makes no fucking sense. They were colonized by Spain and Portugal, okay, colonized by Europeans, just like the US and Canada was colonized by Europeans. It's the same. It's just that Spanish people have maybe slightly darker skin tones. The the trauma that the Spanish people put their the native population through was a little bit different to where there's a little bit more of the influence of the native population in that population. So they have sl- they're less likely to be blonde, right, for example. But you know what? They're still blonde Mexicans and they're totally Mexican. You know, there are still white people and black people in these countries, just like there are white people and black people in Canada and in the U.S. for the same reasons that they're in Canada and the U.S. It's not different. And yet we have determined that this is this other racial category, even though they have a history that's basically the same as Canada and the U.S. But for some reason, Canada and the U.S., white people get to be a different category and white people in Central and South America are Latino for some reason. Right. We just decided this. It doesn't it it isn't meaningless. We just decided this. And so this thing that started as classism that was built into the district because there needed to be a separation. If you have an entire society of people who can't afford to eat, you're going to have an uprising faster than you know what to do with. If you have a society that is split into different levels of a higher class that can afford to eat and a poorer class that is dying, Mm -hmm. then you're not going to have as much you're going to have infighting more than you're going to have an uprising Mm -hmm. 
that started as classism and is now slowly being towards towards or turned towards racism because of this new creation of this new race that is existing in this mm-hmm. society and that is not happening on accident Mm-mm. that is all a political commentary happening in the background of these books mm-hmm. uh that is really showing that like this is the hold that district 12 or that that the capital has on these districts to make them reflect the classism that's happening on a larger scale in their own individual communities uh in order to retain power Mm -hmm. huh Mm -hmm. i wonder if that's how it works here and now wow (laughs) i don't know landon i don't know (laughs) Chat's on fire though, Ninja and Bree. Y'all are killing it with your comments. Thank you. I You're one hundred percent right. You are saying <laughs> uh, I'm watching the chat. I'm not logged in because Twitch hates my computer. Uh, so I am appreciating and agreeing with a lot of what's being said. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So so that's why District Twelve is set up the way that it is, and um and yeah and and in in the books, Katniss's appearance is described. The way that it is, and it, it's unfortunate that that Jennifer Lawrence doesn't really look like Katniss, but it doesn't matter. She gives an amazing performance. We'll talk more about it when we do the movie episode. This movie episode is going to be forever because there's just so much good. I but know. yes, no, I think that like what this shows is how the isms exist in this dystopian world, reflect our own, but also hold power towards like how the capital keeps control because then you have the situation that obviously we'll see Peta and 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 Katniss deal with more in the second book but probably won't talk about but then we've also seen Hamish deal with which is like okay what if you then break the class system within your own society mm-hmm. because they are so rich after the Hunger Games, they are, they are given a house, they are given more money and food than they could ever think to spend. They basically have a capital income in a society that doesn't have any way for that to like to be spent. So suddenly they're isolated on a hill, its own class of people. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, which is just also very interesting how that exists because you then isolate your victors. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and then evil. and then we'll talk about how they're not allowed to give their money out to break the system because that breaks mm-hmm. the system. Mm-hmm. Capital is evil. Wow. <laughs> they're the bad guys. <laughs> oh, my All gosh. Right. Shall we move on? Yes. Let's go to the next thing. Let's All right. Let's talk about Katniss Everdeen herself. Girl so- on fire. We said we'd talk a little bit about Katniss and um, and some specifics about her character. Because this book is from her perspective, there's a lot to it. Um, Katniss goes through quite a journey. She starts out traumatized and she ends up more traumatized. So her character development is definitely down. Um, poor girl. She is not... She unfortunately isn't... Um, She's not dumb, right? But she's not like very bright in the ways of like understanding all the different inner workings of her world. She She really just knows how to survive herself. Yeah, she's young and she's a girl who's who's had to survive and who has lived on the brink of death her entire life, fought for survival, has become responsible for keeping her family alive. Mm -hmm. And when you are in a state of like I am fighting day by day to get food on the table and make sure my friend, my my sister and my mother do not starve. You can't take in the concepts of what is happening in your neighborhood, let alone your district, let alone your world. Mm-hmm. It's too big. Mm-hmm. Maslow's yeah. hierarchy of needs. Your needs are not being met. <laughs> yep, yep. So so Gail ends up becoming kind of the mouthpiece within this book for some of those things. And he's the one that's making comments on some of those things. Mm-hmm. Katniss really doesn't get a chance to, like, but she feels it, right? So even though she doesn't fully understand what's going on and can't make, like, articulate comments about what's going on, what she can do is say, I hate them. I hate them for what they're doing to us. I know that they are, are the problem that 
that uh, that these rich people are the problem. Um, unfortunately, she cannot comment further than that. And uh, as the books go on, she gets more and more sucked into that world of uh, revolutionaries and learns more about it. But I think at the end of the day, Katniss's main drive, no matter what, is surviving. If she if she goes to bed that night and wakes up the next morning, she has been successful. That is the main and only thing she really is concerned about. And I think that like that's part of what's frustrating about her character at the beginning is because she has an inability to as someone who just said that uh in the chat. Um Ninja Ninja, ninja. yeah, ninja said it. That uh, she's constantly growing, and how that that is not the same thing as being naivety. That's like this. That's growth. Uh, but when you're watching someone who's just struggling day by day and not getting the bigger picture, that's a tough thing to watch when you are getting the bigger picture. Mm-hmm. When you know about the bigger world, you're just mm-hmm. like get there already. Uh, and yeah. I think that 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 puts a really tough thing in your mouth because unless you've been in Katniss's position, it's hard to conceptualize how overwhelming Katniss's position is. And I think that in the later books, you get characters actually talking to her about this frustration yes. with her. But in this book, the only part that you really get with that is Hamish being frustrated with trying to coach her and getting her to understand like what it is that she's supposed to do. Like She understands what he's telling her to do. But it takes her a long time to make the connections as to why. Like she really doesn't understand the strategy until Peta is almost dying and Hamish sends them soup because they had a kiss. Like that is yeah. that she, is when she actually she, finally gets the strategy. She's like, like at the end of the book. Oh, <laughs> this this does do things. Yeah. This this is a good thing that I hate, but I can be a part of. Um yeah. and I think that like that that is obviously a pivotal moment for her because then she also like decides to play the games Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like that is the other thing and i think that 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 becomes important because so much of it of this book is her refusal to do it her refusal to do it because she doesn't understand it but she still refuses to do it she still like she, she does a little bit with Cinna when Cinna talks her down to it and says, hey, let's talk about this. Like she she's willing to do it a little bit. But for the most part, she is unwilling to play the games until this point. And then we watch her go into the next one where she is all for playing the games. Uh, it's just that the games change. And the thing about Katniss Everdeen is that she can't handle change. We'll talk about that in a second. But mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, totally, Ninja. When we get to the when we get to the third book where it really gets heavy into the politics, um, we're definitely going to talk more about that because yeah. she doesn't really want to be recognized by others. Like she doesn't really want to win the game. She just wants to survive and get back home to Prim. She um, just yeah, that's that's what this whole this is the story of survival. Yeah, and how far someone is willing to go to survive, mm-hmm. and it's terrifying like yeah. it, it, she does not at any point in time feel safe to wake up the next day mm-mm, mm-mm. um and she won't for the rest of it mm-hmm. like it is go 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 for Katniss here on out yep and the very interesting thing um about all of this when you're watching her and you you have the uh, insight into her actual thoughts, you know, how others seem to feel about her. They Others kind of tap into that she's very authentic and very predictable, and they really like that, and they kind of like um, attach to her, right? But when you are privy to all of her thoughts, you find out that she actually doesn't really have the uh, the strong ability to empathize with others. The only person she truly cares about is Prim. If Prim is happy, then everybody else can fuck right off. She has no qualms with killing the other contestants in the Hunger Games when she thinks she can do so successfully. The only time she hesitates is when she thinks that it might not work and she might die, right? Survivability, not actually trying to win, um, any of that. But she doesn't really care about killing them. She doesn't like think about... Uh, oh, I'm such a bad person for killing them. Like, she doesn't think about that ever at all. When you can imagine that Peta probably has those thoughts, like Peta, he does not want to kill. It is against his and, moral principles to do so. And but Katniss he doesn't, doesn't care about that. 
And yeah. that's the other thing about that is that Peter doesn't yeah. kill. Peter, no, he Peter doesn't. doesn't. Peter doesn't make a single kill uh, in both mm-hmm. Hunger Games. Uh, he isn't violent until, until without spoilers, until he is turned to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, like, yeah, I, that's another weird way that they're so completely different. I think that also, not only is that survival so an, such an integral part of Katniss's character, but also like her feel of responsibility to the people that she has affection for is also so ingrained in her of like she was like no fuck you to the capital when they wanted to take rue's body Mm -hmm. um she was pissed because she had formed this connection with this little girl and and had been so angry about it she Mm -hmm. Like even even like um like the 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 response to you know finding out that Peta had like taken the bear had been had been getting nightshade berries like that is also based her anger is based off of like the response to that of like mm-hmm. I care about this person um not in a romantic way but I care about them I don't want them to die so I'm going to have an emotion about that um. Like she is at at heart, even though she is this colder character, tougher character, she cares so much about other people more than she cares about her own safety. It is just her own survival that is paramount. Or and even yeah. then, that's not paramount because she gave up her own survival and chances of living for Prim. Yeah, and the thing is, though, is that Katniss's connection with Rue really doesn't have anything to do with Rue. Like, I mean, no. I love Katniss and Rue. I I do, but I'm about I'm sorry if it messes this up for anybody. But the only reason Katniss cares about Rue is because it reminds her of Prim. Mm-hmm. If it was not for that, she would treat Rue just like she treats like Foxface, for example, as just another contestant. Yes. Um so it's not really about Rue. <clears throat> it doesn't really matter. Um she she gets attracted to Rue as somebody to ally with because it reminds her of Primrose. And then it turns out Rue sings to to the mocking Jays. And that's like, oh, my dad used to do that. So literally Rue and Katniss are friends because Katniss is um sort of pushing this uh oh you remind me of my family onto yeah. Rue. It has nothing to do with the Rue herself. Um she's and I think projecting. that you see Yeah, and you see this kind of thing in other areas as well. Like at the beginning when Katniss talks about how she doesn't really have any friends. She has a hunting buddy, Gail, and then she has Madge, you know, who doesn't appear in the movies. But Madge basically is like another girl that she can like pair with for group projects or whatever, who um, similarly is unbothered like Katniss is. Um, But she has no affection for Madge. Like, she doesn't really, I mean, Madge gives her the Mockingjay pin. In the movies, Prim gives it to her, but in the books, this girl Madge does. Uh, And the reason Madge does it in the books is a kind of symbol to say, like, you know, the District 12's leaders are not very harsh. Madge is the mayor's daughter. So the District 12 leaders are sympathetic to the poor people of District 12. That's the whole point of Madge. Um, But you know what? Katniss really could not care one way or the other about Madge. She exists because sometimes, um, you know, you have to to work with a partner. And so when that happens, she works with Madge. And that's it. Like Katniss really doesn't have a lot of thoughts about other people in their own personhood. It's Mm -hmm. when she thinks about other people, it has a lot more to do with her own moral first principles than thinking of the relationships or other people as individuals. It's more about like, you know, doing this thing is wrong overall. And so I'm going to make sure that this person doesn't go through that. Right. It's not about like, I care about you individually. That is not something that Katniss experiences. Which again is so 16 year old. Oh yeah. Like, like once again, proving that this is the, this is not only the most accurate written 16 year old, (laughs) but like it it also like resonates to that too, because I think a lot of people could feel that way of like, oh, there are a few small people that I care about. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And when, how could she, she has no room in her heart for that because she's just trying to survive. Yep. There is, there is no blame there. Simply that is part of Katniss's character. Mm -hmm. But I think what also is fascinating is that we are inside this mind and the character that the capital builds 
in place of that is fascinating because I think that there are aspects of truth in the capital's perception of Katniss, such as uh, like her honesty can be can, and bluntness can be read as uh, like brave, can be read as fearless. Um, her need for survival can be read as tenacity, Mm -hmm. um, can be read as strong and can be twisted that way. So that even though we are living inside of Katniss's mind, there is a perception of her character being built, um, and, and a, and a persona that the character, that the capital is creating, which by the way, is the same persona that the media here in our world created for Katniss Mm -hmm. in this movie, in the movie Mm -hmm. version of it. Mm -hmm. Like, (laughs) like, like there's, there's a lot of meta things going on with that. But I think that that's also an interesting thing as we start to, uh, as we start to live inside of Katniss's mind, knowing who she is as a character and going forward through this movie for through this book and the next few of like being like, okay, but how does everybody else see her? And is that projections of not understanding Katniss as a full as, as a whole? Or is this because Katniss doesn't have an understanding of who she is in the greater world? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Is Katniss autistic? I have heard that before. Listen. And I would not be surprised. I, I have never read any interviews with Suzanne Collins that, that confirms or denies this or shows that like she purposefully wrote Katniss as autistic. But um, but I do think that that interpretation is valid. I could, I could see Here it. Here is a rant. You ready? I'll make it tiny. But uh, a lot of people in literature, I feel like, write characters to feel special and to feel different uh, because they want them to be unique. And often what they accidentally do is write neurodivergent characters. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh <laughs> Well, because you so want to do that, Katniss, right? Because yes. you, your character, your, your your point of view character has to be special. Otherwise, yes. why the heck are they the point of view character? You pick somebody else, you know? So Katniss being autistic makes sense to me. PETA also being autistic makes sense to me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'm just like, mm, you two are two autistic beings who are just traumatized. Yeah. I uh, and it. one of you has a masks, mask that you are able to wear and one of you does not because yeah. you never had to. Katniss, uh, <laughs> Katniss is um ne- a, a never masked autistic. I can see yes. it. Mm-hmm. Uh, she, did, she didn't have to. She just had to go in and survive. And PETA did have to because of the things that we're going to talk about in our next segment. But before yeah. we do that... Uh, is there anything else we want to say on campus? No, no, no. We're good. Keep going. Keep going. Amazing. Let's have a word from our sponsor. Yes. All right, you guys. So, um, oh, I can't spell A U T I B. Okay. So, as always, oh my gosh, thank you so much, Lunar. Thank Club you so Moon much. We're gonna do pins, a tier one um, sub to Arius Kai at the end for these. Two, they have given eighty six uh, gift subs, subs in the channel. Ah, oh, thank you. Okay. So, um, Audible. If uh, if you like reading but don't have time to read like me, I highly recommend Audible. We uh, we use it like literally the this episode. I listened to the Audible version of this book. It is narrated by the absolutely ineffable Miss Orphan Black, uh, Miss She Hulk. She's great. It's a really awesome. Um, it's a really awesome audiobook of The Hunger Games, except for the singing part. I'm very sorry. I'm warning you now. The singing parts, uh, Tatiana Mason Lee, she can't do it. She should have, somebody else should have done the singing parts. But everything else is fantastic, and she's absolutely a wonderful narrator. Um, so I literally recommend the Audible version of, uh, of Hunger Games if you would like to read along with us. I'm also going to be doing the Audible versions for the next two books as well. So... That being said, Landon, um, do you have a specific book recommendation for us I this week? I do. Is it going to show today? <sighs> I mentioned this last week uh, as like a one-off, but then we've been reading it, our, our last our last thing, but we've been reading it a little bit more in class. And I find that the themes of the world and political ways that it is written into YA, very relatable. So I am relating. I am uh, recommending Ender's Game by Orson Scott Card. Don't read past the first one. Uh, do yourself a favor. <laughs> it's 
gets weird. <laughs> it gets not good. And I will also admit that Orson Scott Card, not good. Uh, but unfortunately, many writers are not. Uh, however, Ender's Game has a lot of insight into the corruption of a system that wants to remain in control, even though it shouldn't remain in control, very similar to the capital, of uh, the abuse and exploitation of children in uh, the exploration of adults. In fact, I think that so many of these books have a lot in common that I am, invading, I am uh, changing my entire curriculum this year so that we are reading... Ender's Game right now as a class, and then I'm going to make them read Hunger's Game uh, next, because I think that there's a lot of themes and similarities between these two novels uh, that should not be forgotten. Uh, so uh, this That would be a good, a good class exercise. Compare Ender's Game to Hunger Games. Right? Yeah, I think I, would that would be really, be really good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so audibletrial.com slash interstage window. Go sign up for your 30-day free trial now. It's no obligation. You can cancel it, and we still get the benefits um, as far as supporting the channel goes. But if you are going to do that, then you can use your first credit for either Landon's recommendation here or maybe the next Hunger Games book if you'd like to read along with us um, for the next Hunger Games episode that we do in a couple yeah, of months. Yeah. Uh, or anything that you feel like. If nonfiction yeah. is, your ga- is, your, is your way, there's a lot of podcasts available on the app. It's a mm-hmm. really great service. Uh, and if you love to read but just don't have time to read... This is a way to solve that problem. Yep, it's good stuff. I love Audible. Love Audible. All right. Let's go to our next thing. So, from the creators who brought you Sprot, Spot the Problems, this is going to be our new Hunger Games themed segment. And that is, it's trauma time. It's trauma time. Because these kids are going to die, die, die. Because these kids are going to die. Now, here's the thing. We know Hollywood loves to make 16-year-olds be played by 24-year-olds who do not look look, 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 well, look like 16-year-olds. So we would like to remind you that these are children. And this is the realistic version of what they would have looked like. Yeah. So this is 15-year-old Josh Hutcherson and 16-year-old Jennifer Lawrence. This is what Katniss and Peeta actually looked like during the Hunger Games, not what they were played in the movies. So as we're, um, you know, talking about all these things that these uh, characters experience, this is what they actually would have looked like, something closer to this. So, yeah. No, this, They're is, kids. this is it. They're children. They're babies. The Bobbeds, the Bridge to Terabithia Bridge of Terabithia Nightmares. Nightmares. Yes. First of all, <laughs> amazing book. Second of all, anyway, <laughs> uh, yes. So we are going to talk about a lot of the trauma in this particular book that I feel is really is really necessary to talk about in terms of character is the trials of growing up. Uh, these kids not only have an incredibly traumatic experience here, but they also have a uh, terrible background. Their whole life <laughs> no has been one, trauma. No one is good. Their whole life has been trauma, uh, which is very common. Uh, any writers in the chat, we know how we like to traumatize our characters, especially before, especially before owning them. And then you're like, oh, this is mine. Now I'm going to control. I'm going to continue to traumatize it further. Mm -hmm. Uh, Suzanne Collins did the same thing. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the trials that these kids had to face growing up. Mm -hmm. Uh, The first one is abuse. (laughs) Yep. Straight up physical and mental and emotional abuse. Yep. The one and only um, scene that we get that actually shows anything about PETA's uh, childhood is basically his mom um, whacking the shit out of his head. That's um that's it. She's very mad that he burned the bread and uh and she wants him to feel pain for that. So we have this dynamic with Peta where the way that we understand it from the little bit that we see is his mother is incredibly physically and emotionally abusive and uh really that family is still together because his father holds them together for dear fucking life. They are all terrorized by his mom basically, is what we come to know. Now, after this first book, we really don't hear much else about PETA's family because, as we said before, like, once you win the games, you move to the the winner's circle. And so, like, their family doesn't have to 
struggle anymore. So like, it's just, we just don't talk about that anymore. But here's the thing. PETA is from the merchant class of District 12, right? He's not from the seam. He's not a seam kid. And yet they still are shown as struggling. Yeah, they're not struggling in the sense that they're starving, but they're struggling in the sense that there is nothing else for them. They cannot have goals. They run their little bread shop. They will always run their little bread shop and they will never ever do anything different or better. That is simply their lot in life and they are stuck in that hole. So what PETA's abuse really shows is that this stratification, it sucks for every level. Like they are decidedly middle class and this stratification sucks for them too. They are pained by this. If they weren't, they wouldn't have this situation where their mother was so incredibly abusive because it's never said that his parents are anything but have always been merchant class, right? Like we can basically assume that. And yet Pete is getting beaten. Just, just straight up been beaten. Yeah. Uh, and like, like not kindly, like, and not in a way of like, like he talks, like there's talks about him having bruises and he talks yeah. about how vital it was and that it was all from his mother, which I think is a very interesting thing too. Um, And I think that, it's interesting that Peta is so different from Gail and Katniss in terms of like, again, back to that gentle uh, kind of character of like, okay, I'm going to, I have to make myself smaller because this is, because I am fearful almost. Uh, and that, and, and he is the one that goes through this physical abuse while Gail and Katniss do not. Uh, and I think that that's a distinct character difference between the three. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Gail, we are not aware of any direct abuse that he experiences. Katniss will talk about the abuse that she experiences in a moment. And I think we can imagine that Gail must have experienced something similar because he's in a similar position, but we don't really know. Welcome in, Koneko. It's going awesome. Hello. Um, you're You're at the fun part. We're at the trauma time segment. That's our new segment for Hunger Games. It's not spot the problems anymore. It's trauma time. Trauma time. <laughs> so, so yeah, it, it, it's easy to look at Hunger Games and see all of the things that Katniss goes through because we're looking at it from her perspective. And uh, she is from the poorer part of her district and think that PETA is privileged. So the reason why we are opening up this section with mentioning PETA's abuse is because we want to make sure that everybody understands that privilege is relative, okay? And PETA does not have a good childhood either. He doesn't go into the games with a healthy brain. That's not what happens. He is already traumatized, and the games traumatize him further. And also, like, privilege is complicated. In aspects of, like, we talk about privilege I feel like in such a black and white manner especially when it comes to like media terms um but like you can be privileged in one area and not in another mm-hmm. like um w- like so comparing the two yeah Peter doesn't know what it's like to be hungry to the point of starvation but Peter knows what it's like to be beaten by a parent that's supposed to love him doesn't know what it's like to be unconditionally loved. Katniss knows what it's like to be unconditionally loved. Her father was this unconditionally loved person. Mm-hmm. Uh, and obviously she lost she lost him, so there's grief there. Um, but also, like, she's also experienced what it's like to be hungry. Like, both of them are not necessarily privileged. Like, they're both privileged in a certain way and certain aspects, but also not privileged in another um and that really like i think awakens the i what i appreciate is about the subtlety of all of these backgrounds existing within these the two characters uh and gail if you throw in gail there too because it doesn't necessarily matter where they come from it just informs us the readers where he comes from yeah, yeah, Zaw. So I think um, that Hunger Games, the narrative of it really does 
speak a lot about intersectionalism without ever mm-hmm. really using that word, of course. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think it's fascinating. Yep. Uh, another so thing. In, instead of physical abuse, though, um, what Katniss and Gail experience is something different. Their abuse has a specific name called adultification. So whenever Katniss's father passes away, their mother is so depressed, she simply stops taking care of Mm -hmm. herself, their home, and her kids. Like, she simply just gives up on doing anything. And they would have died if it weren't for Katniss going in and going hunting for them the way that her father taught her. Um, If it wasn't for Katniss making sure that Prim got to school in the morning, um, if it wasn't for Katniss making sure that they had, you know, clothes to wear and, uh, and things like that, she made sure that they had some money. So they, Katniss, and this happens somewhat to Gail too, only he doesn't have the tragedy of father dying and the mother checking out gail just has a whole mess of siblings they got more kids than they can take care of but i think three parents (laughs) but but i think that like that's a good thing because that feeds to like gail's ability to have access to a world outside of their own survival because he has two people that he can kind of rely on yeah he's the third parent he is the third parent whereas whereas dad died and as a result katniss became the parent yeah um, with a parent still living in the house, just unable to cope with the world. Yeah. Uh, so she had two kids. She went from zero kids to two kids instantly. Yes. Um, and obviously holds a lot of resentment and anger for that, Katniss mm-hmm. does. But also, like, what that informs us is those choices we talked about, how Katniss is willing to do anything, including sacrifice herself for the people that she cares about, comes from and stems from this adultification of Prim is the number one thing in my life that I have to keep safe. My duty and responsibility is making sure that Prim is alive, fed, and kept means that I'm going to volunteer my life for the Hunger Games. It means that I'm going to stick a big old middle finger up and try to get back there. Uh, means that like knowing Prim is going to die without me. And that is a reason why I'm going to continue to play this game. When obviously like at some point she gives up on that. Like that's at, at the point in time at the end where the, where they're like, Hey, just kidding. You guys have to kill each other and only one victor can happen. Uh, sp- that, Katniss was like, just kidding, I'm going to kill myself. <laughs> like, like that is the only point in time where it stopped, mm-hmm. was when there was no more options. Everything else was, I have to do everything for everybody. Mm-hmm. And that's adultification. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. So Katniss is abused as well. She is not abused physically or emotionally. She is abused through the specific process of adultification and we can assume that gail is treated similarly just not as extreme which is why gail is able to spend time thinking about the world more complexly and more about like his hatred towards the capital and the people that live in the capital whereas katniss kind of thinks like oh gosh she spends a lot of energy on this thing you know she's a little bit tired of of hearing about a lot of it even though she basically agrees with him but it's because she doesn't have room in her brain for it she is so adultified that this is the only thing she has time to do yes uh and then i think that our third one is just as important and hits both of them is growing up impoverished Mm -hmm. um i think that for for Peta, it is obviously more his proximity to poverty uh, however, being in proximity and still affected by poverty, because even though he was of the merchant class, they certainly still struggled. They certainly still like, and that was a lot what the abuse was about was the struggles of like owning a shop in a town that could not afford its services. Uh, and that's where mom's anger and frustration came from. So like that is exists in relation to poverty whereas Katniss and Gail live within poverty Mm -hmm. um all of it has an effect 
on the growing up and way of viewing the world. But yeah, it, it was like Katniss had to be solution oriented. She had to figure out, I can't make money. So I have to figure out how to get food. Yep. And I poverty, have to figure out. Poverty is a specific kind of trauma. Yeah. Like if you grew up in poverty, even if your parents were wonderful, even if your community supported you as much as they could, there are still traumas associated with that. You cannot grow up in poverty and not experience some kind of trauma. Economic trauma is trauma. It Mm -hmm. is. So all of the characters grow up with this kind of like poverty blanket over them. No matter how good anyone is in District 12, they are all wrapped up in poverty. Of knowing that almost every single one of their lives revolve around money, mm-hmm. like around the survival of whether there is enough money to continue to do what they are doing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas then going to the capital where money is not even a question and no one around them struggles with this, this same constant, like, again, you, you're living in it. So it's not even a thing that you're aware that you're thinking of when you're impoverished to the point that they have been, that you're just like constantly on edge of like being like, when is my next meal going to come? How am I going to be able to do this? How am I going to be able to do this? Like that is, that is, even though like it's related to their world and our world, that is the trauma that comes with it is that constant anxiety of having to figure that out. All of a sudden being taken out of that place, having those same thoughts and processing in a place where no one else is worried about that is crazy making. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yep. that's kind of something that they're dealing with on the side of all of this is like, not only am I not in control because I don't have control here because my life is about to be put on the line, but now I have to, like, I still have all these thoughts and it's also what makes them successful when they go into the games yeah, because they already have the pathways of thinking 10 steps ahead of solution of finding solutions of those basic needs being met because they always had to worry about it. Mm-hmm. And whereas, it's heavily, Oh, sorry, go ahead. I'll let you finish. I was your say, whereas the careers, that's not something you can teach. That in itself is not something you can ever teach. You can teach how to hit hard, how to shoot, how to do all of those things. You cannot teach how to be alert to the point of traumatized. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> and the thing is um, that I think, I think the books imply, even in the first book, it kind of implies this. Years that the careers have not won, that's why they won, right? Most of the years a career wins because... They're bigger, faster, stronger, more more skilled in combat, whatever, right? But there are plenty of years that a career doesn't win, and it's down to strategy when that happens every mm-hmm. time. That's what we that's what we understand. So, yeah. yep, there isn't a single character in this that gets out scot free. Not really. No. And and again, all of this can also be said like. And he, like, if you want to talk about Hamish's character, he also grew up in proximity to poverty, which is why he was successful in his games. Like, yeah, absolutely. Yep. And then, oh, change versus control. So when you are traumatized, your brain, this is how the trauma, this is how trauma affects the brain. Your brain searches any way that it possibly can for control. Uh, because your brain is part of your body and your body does not like what is happening when you are traumatized, which means it is going crazy. So it is trying to find a way to grasp all of those neurons that are firing to get control. Well, the last thing someone who is traumatized wants is change to happen <laughs> because change is the opposite of control. Yep. Yep. Um, <laughs> which is why as human beings, change is so difficult. Yep. We have that need for bodily autonomy. That is a base need that everyone has. And uh, it manifests in all kinds of fun ways when you are traumatized, right? So some examples that we had where Katniss took control 
of situations that, um, you know, she ends up winning the Hunger Games. But at the end of the day, these were all to her detriment. OK, they did not actually help her overall. Right. Volunteering no. for Prim. Um, going and knocking PETA out so that she could go to the cornucopia, right? Um, yep. Deciding mm-hmm. that her and PETA are going to, you know, suicide pack together it's... with the berries. Um, I was trying to think of one of those fancy words that people use for that to replace that word, but whatever. Yeet anyway, themselves. it's this far. It's this far into the stream. I hopefully YouTube doesn't care when I upload the vod. Oh yeah, um, I didn't even think about that earlier. Sorry. Yeah, there's all of these moments when uh, Katniss is like oh, um, I feel so out of control. I'm going to do whatever the fuck I need to do. Oh. I'm not going to think through it. I don't need to think through it because this need for control is so strong that it doesn't matter. One right? of my absolute favorites is when uh, she attacks PETA because uh, he said that he loved her. <laughs> like she just straight up starts screaming and goes to like attack him. Uh, yep. Because he said a thing that no longer put her in control. Yeah. Uh, and and as a reaction, without even thinking it through and without even thinking a why, without even considering that it might be true, uh, she just goes into, I need I need to seize this back. No mm-hmm. way can we have this being out there. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And he, poor Peter and, didn't deserve that. He was telling the truth. Oh, <laughs> he was doing what he thought was okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so like this, grasp of change versus control is something that has obviously followed her all of her life but follows her so much in the games and is mm-hmm. really the thing that she struggles with the most yeah it like, is I'll give, I'll give my favorite uh, an example sorry let me give one more example before you make your point so my favorite example is whenever um rue dies and she puts the flowers all around the body and she even in her internal thoughts thinks about how dangerous and stupid this is, but it does not matter because she needs a moment where she feels in control. She knows I'm in the games already. I'm probably going to die. If I piss the capital off, who the fuck cares? I need a moment of control. I'm going to decorate her body. Um, That's my favorite moment. And I think that's exactly Mm -hmm. where it comes from. It comes from like, I need a second of control or I'm going to like lose my shit. And all of the, yeah, and I think it's all of those moments, A, is what makes the story, but also, like, as you said, to her detriment, those are all where, like, the times that she makes mistakes are, or the times that she makes decisions and choices that then domino where she is going to end up, Mm -hmm. is, in some weird way, we once again, the YA, (laughs) it's like a way that it like turns a trope again. YA always has female protagonists. Very, very rarely do they let female protagonists drive their own story. Mm -hmm. Uh, The stories are driven around female protagonists and you are and female protagonists are meant to be pants that you put yourself in, sit in and, and the story achieves around you. Uh, In some weird way, this happens, even though Katniss is making choices far more than the average female protagonist and is making choices and has some control over her own narrative, because it's an instant reaction and there is no real control, it's just a reaction to change, it turns that trope on the head where it's like, yeah, she's making decisions, but the world's still happening around her. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yes, she's she is she is driving, she is in the driver's seat for this. Mm-hmm. But it not in the way that she wants to be, mm-hmm. not in the way that the world that she would choose to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, like, she's making decisions like volunteering for Prem, where it's like, oh, OK, where was the logic in that? There obviously wasn't any. And as much as we would love to think that we would volunteer for our siblings or the people that we care about, to do it to this strength and to this conviction at this point in the way that it happened you got to be severely traumatized. Yeah, I don't I don't know. I don't know if 16-year-old me would have done that. I think 16-year-old me would have been distraught, but I don't know if 16-year-old me would have been like I volunteer as tribute. You know what I mean? I think I think 16-year-old me might have for for one of my siblings. I love both of them <laughs> equally. Don't say who, don't say who. <laughs> I don't <have to> say <laughs> who. Uh <laughs> never do that. Um uh, but I think that at the same time, uh, I would not survive. Like I, it would be 
like I'll be honest, Katniss and I had a lot. I had a lot in common with Katniss. So like, there's a <laughs> lot of that same sort of upbringing that happens there, of like, oh, cool. Like, of course, that change versus control. I a hundred percent would like let my trauma drive the bus on that one, uh, in the way that Katniss did. But most people, and maybe even not me, would have done that. Yeah. Uh, but that's a hundred percent like a choice that she makes that then fucks her for the rest of the series. Mm-hmm. Um, she has a decidedly worst life because of all these various things yes. that you just pointed. Everything that she did, she has a worse life than she could have had if she hadn't done that thing. And that is because of like that fight for control. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it will be interesting as, and, and it's interesting to watch as the story gets bigger. Because right now, the reality is, is that the Hunger Games, while it has all of these hints at a bigger societal thing, it really is about Katniss. It really is about the unjustness of Katniss's life. Mm-hmm. Well, the next one is going to be the unjustness of the system. Yep. And then the one after that is going to be the unjustness of the world. And it's going to get bigger and bigger. And as something gets bigger, the less control you have of it. And it will be very interesting to watch this concept and theme of change versus control exist through the rest of the books because it's certainly not solved in this one. No, it's not. So yeah, that's that's the Hunger Games. Um, so that brings us towards the end of the episode. And towards the end of the episode, we always like to ask, um, did it resonate? So Landon, in 2023, does the Hunger Games still resonate? The Hunger Games aged like fine wine, Karen. It resonates. It resonates more than it did then. It is amazing. <laughs> this book just chef's kiss Mm -hmm. what about you Karen did it resonate oh my god it resonates so much Suzanne Collins managed to take a conceit that has existed in several of uh, other pieces before hers which is kids go fight to the death okay kids have to go survive with only other kids around them and, and they kill each other right this is a thing that's in lots of different things before the Hunger Games. But Suzanne Collins took this conceit and said, what if about America? And I'm like, hmm, Suzanne Collins, you are so right. Yes, it absolutely resonates in 2023. I'm so excited to read the next ones and see how I feel about them. Um, you know, as this goes on, these this this will be the third time that I've read the Hunger Games books. And I have to say, after the third reread of the first one, it resonates even more. I get more out of I got more out of it every time I read these books mm-hmm. and I think that as our world continues to march decidedly towards late stage capitalism and decidedly towards a world that is more stratified than ever things like the Hunger Games will continue to resonate more and more and more. Yeah. Um so and it's not only the the book in concept. Um, I love Katniss more every time I read this. I feel like I understand her character more and more, and uh, and identify with her more and more every I feel like single I, time. I appreciate her more. Yes. Like, that I'm like how she was written, and the care in her character that it was written with. Mm-hmm. I also, as you were saying, what you're saying, I was like, man. First thing that popped in my head was kids killing kids. I was like, oh, yeah, very Lord of the Flies-esque. Yeah, yeah. Um, And then I was like, man, I can't wait until 50 years from now when they try to remake Hunger Games into something that it's completely not. Just kind of like they did with Lord of the Flies when they tried to make it an all-female, an all-women's moot, like a book about a bunch of women on an island doing the same thing that Lord of the Flies. (sighs) It's like, it's actually a concept about how toxic masculinity exists. And I just can't wait until someone doesn't get it with Hunger Games and we're all just like, did you miss the point? (laughs) Yeah, Lord of the Flies is all about how toxic masculinity starts early. It embeds yes. itself in boys' brains early. That's the whole yes. point of it. So if it's <laughs> about like, all girls, it's a totally they were like, different book. <laughs> feminism. Let's make it. Let's make it about women. Let's do this. This classic thing about about women. It's like I don't know if you know this, but how young girls are socialized to behave within a, a higher class society is not the same way that boys are told to behave. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for the applause, you guys. Now Landon can live another week. I'm going to try the applause again. I think I got it working. I'm sorry it broke for you, Lunar, but here, this this is this is yours. There we go. Now it, it played. Applause, <laughs> applause, applause. 
There we go. So yeah, that's that's Hunger Games. We're gonna talk about the second book um in what's this March in May. Okay, so in May okay. we're gonna do the next Hunger Games book. So if you would like to read along with us, then please go ahead and read it before May gets here because that's when we're gonna be talking about it. Oh my gosh, thank you, Zasu. I'm so glad you stayed for the whole thing. Me um, too. Being a new viewer and all that's like really amazing. I really really appreciate that. Um, we put a lot of work into these, so I'll say a couple things about the the slide deck since we're done with the conversation. Um, Landon puts a ton into these. Uh, these these particular episodes do take a lot of work, so I really really appreciate when you guys enjoy them. Um, you know, because this is kind of like it's like me and Landon's book club, and we put it out for all of all of you guys to kind of uh, hear it. So I really I really do love that. So yeah, what's coming next, Landon? Let's do do the next slide so we can tell them what's next. All right, you guys. Um, <laughs> There it goes. Okay. So if you want to come back next week, we're going to be talking all about love triangles. Uh, love triangles are a big feature of the Hunger Games. So we're going to talk a little bit about how the love triangle, the way that it was used for the capital, the way that the Hunger Games love triangle was used to market the book in real life. And then we're going to segue into that with some like love triangle fun stuff in general. It's going to be a good time. It's going to be more chill episode, you know, um, cause it's kind of like our fandom follow-up episode, but it's going to be really fun. So that's going to be um, next week's interstage window. If you stay yeah, tuned yeah. after um, this right here. So after we're done with this, I'm going to take a little break. We're going to come back. We're going to play some more of our Sims 2 Legacy. We are on Generation 3. We are sending your grandson to college. Um, he is a goth king, and he wants to be a famous icon, a famous actor. So He's we're going to try to get him icon. that. He, yeah. I'm so sorry, but my grandson is already an icon. That's all. That's <laughs> true. Yeah, yeah. We stream for four hours now, Brie. That's changed since the last time you were here. Also, we're going to stream tomorrow. Tomorrow, I'm continuing my Majora's Mask 100% run through. We're going to finish the second temple, the Snowfall Temple. Um, you can find me in all the places. Okay, so here's here's all my things. If you enjoyed the stream today, please drop it a follow. We also post all of our VODs to YouTube. So um, you can follow me on YouTube. If you're watching the VOD on YouTube, please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, all that fun stuff. If you enjoyed today's episode. Twitter is my main social media. That's what I'm going to use until Ermine Muskrat destroys it. And you can also hop in the Discord if you just like to chat with me or Landon, or if you want to get really reliable notifications. I have pings for all the different things in the Discord. So um, if you want to support me, you can do so in all of the usual ways. Uh, I do things the same way every other streamer does. You can use all the Twitch stuff. I've got a tip jar. I've got a merch store. Um, I've got a thrown wish list, you know, all the fun stuff. Oh no, Koneko, the Love Triangle stream is going to be so fun. You have to watch it afterwards. So that's that's all the stuff for me. Landon, um, where can everybody find you? You can find me mostly on Instagram and on TikTok. Uh, I'm working on a super secret project. Who knows when that's going to come out, but there probably will be hinters and hints and fun things there, here and everywhere. So uh, you can follow me on there at Land in Maine is my handle. Also, if you scroll down into my about on Twitch, you can yes. find where Landon wrote a poetry book. It's uh, around the world. It's that that link down there. If you click on that guy, uh, you'll find her poetry book. Um, she's a poet, if you didn't know it. I am, a, I am a poet, if you didn't know it. I said that in my class the other day, and my children booed me out of the room. Children are cruel, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I, I was like, shit like poet that was one of our spelling words because no one knows how to spell anymore, including me, but mostly them. And I said that and they were like, boo, leave. And I was like, okay, I guess. Oh my <laughs> I God. That. Oh my God. <laughs> All right, you guys. Um, So I am, we're going to go ahead and say goodbye to the people watching on YouTube. So for everybody watching on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And of course, as always, don't forget to make it a great day. And don't forget to be awesome. All right.